All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is July 24th, 2024. Oh, let's have a look. How much time we got left on this earth? Give or take 18 days to go. It's it's a nail biter. It's a nail biter. It's exciting. Life is exciting. And it's still hard to imagine being the final generation, being able to understand it, understanding that the Spirit has been leading us, working in us. It is so, so incredible. And tonight, we're going to try to solidify that for those who maybe still haven't taken the plunge, quote unquote, <laughs> a little bit of pun intended. Tonight, we're going to talk about the baptism and what what many have called even what's called the other baptism. There are two types of baptism in Scripture, but one is the one spoken about everywhere, and the other one is only used one time. We'll explain what that means. We'll explain the importance of it. We'll lead you in through Scripture. I'll show just a little clip from a, a video uh, just over four years ago that we did with a pastor that came on. Um, it was a great video. It's one that I share when people email me about baptism. Uh, I have this email that I send that I've been sending to people for a long time now. And in it has this video for people to watch. Um, after you watch this, if you still want to get other angles to be able to fully understand it you can go and watch that video you'll you'll see it when we get to it and uh yeah with that man are we ever in some exciting times it is really wild there's gonna actually be um in the midst of this teaching it's gonna go not not off course but it's gonna you're gonna see another piece kind of added kind of about the middle time frame we're gonna add this other piece as to just what it led and where it brought us to uh, as we get to that point, and then we'll take it back and go back into uh, the rest of the teaching with the baptism as well. But it's wild out there, isn't it? Everything going on in the U.S. and uh, as we all know, the stuff with Trump and the stuff now with Biden, <laughs> it doesn't get any more clear than what's been going on, man. If If people have been watching for a while and have been tracking what's been going on, they knew he wasn't going to continue. You know, they did everything to stop the one guy. They Everybody talked about what would happen next. We even showed when his son was talking about what they would have to try and do next. They tried and they failed. And it's what? It's probably the first time one has attempted to do that and survived and the other guy leaves the race. <laughs> you ever see that happen before? Never in any history at least in the u.s or anywhere else that i'm aware of one guy has the attempt and the other guy loses his job anyways so i find that very interesting because uh in relation to where i'm going to start today once we get to that is something about kamala harris that i shared about from a sister and something that i dug up and it was about a year ago and it was because biden was of course having issues back then that it seemed like she was being readied. And here we are now, one year later, and that is precisely what happened. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it uh, in relation to the sister's dream <clears throat> that she had probably, well, it's over 30 years ago, so it was about 33, 34 years ago now, which means Kamala at the time was, I think, in law school, so nobody knew who she was, and uh, our sister saw her even before she anybody had a clue who she was. And so uh, it, it's pretty wild. And I'm going to share with you something brief in relation to why it's interesting and what could happen from that. And then we'll go into uh, the, the baptism. But as I always start, if anybody's new to the ministry, you can come here to ministryrevealed.com, go into the menu box, and click on intro series. The other thing you can do is come here to the playlists, when you come to the playlist, come to Intro to the End Times Revealed. And this series right here, the Revealed End Times Study Note series, this one has 12 videos in it. I always recommend watching the first four videos. So if you're new to the ministry or newer to the ministry and you haven't watched the first four videos, I highly, highly, highly recommend it because it is extremely powerful and you're going to hear things that you've never heard before 
as you go through these teachings, if you don't watch the intro series, you're going to be lost if you don't understand. And part of it is who the Gospels are speaking to, and the other part is the revelation of how long the tribulation actually is. So in the intro series, the very first video is a 22-minute intro about what the next three teachings are going to start to go into. The second video is a 30-minute Bible study that will begin to give you the understanding of what people have called discrepancies or the differences within the, disc within the Gospels. So within the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, everybody who has read their scriptures knows that there are clear differences in the Gospels. And we've pointed out many of them. Uh, we've explained and we've revealed dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds at this point, and they all point to the revelation of the end of days. One that I always speak about is before Jesus goes to the cross, in Luke, it says that he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe. The Greek word for arrayed means white, beautiful, radiant robe. Kind of sounds like a bride. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple. And in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Well, if you look into the book of Revelation, you see that tribulation colors of the woman riding the beast is arrayed in purple and scarlet. Yet Luke's is the color of the bride, right? Like a, like a beautiful, white, gorgeous bride, bride gown. And you start to say, well, wait a second. You see Jesus on the cross. His last words in Luke are, uh, Father, into your arms I commend my spirit, which means to place me alongside you. And in Mark and in Matthew, it's my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the word forsaken means to leave behind. So you've got Mark and Matthew pertaining to being left behind and them both being tribulation colors. Luke's being placed alongside like a bride arrayed, uh, arrayed in a gorgeous white robe. I mean, it, it starts to really have you question, like, what is going on here? And that's all going to begin to get revealed to you in that first 30-minute intro. And you're going to realize something that these differences that are in the Gospels are there for a reason. And their reason is prophetic. You're going to realize that Luke is speaking to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the left behind mid-trib great multitude rapture. And Matthews is speaking to the post-trib return of the Lord. A taking, a taking, and a return. One that goes to the third heaven, one that goes to paradise, and one that waits for the Lord's return who will inherit the city. You realize pre, mid, and post are all true. And the scriptures that told us the first will be last, the last will be first, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's a wild ride, and that's just the, a little bit of the intro for the 30 minutes. The third video is a 30-minute introduction to the revelation of 14 years because once you understand that the gospels are speaking to different groups of people in the prophetic revelation you're going to then notice that the discourse is luke's is extremely different mark's is different than matthew's and matthew's has way more to it that even goes into chapter 25 and the wording within them is different and when you realize those differences you're going to realize because it was never understood who mark or luke were really speaking to that they've missed the first uh, the first seven years of seals, which if Luke goes pre-trib, Mark's portion is seals, Matthew's portion is trumpets. It is going to blow you blow you away if you've never heard of it before, if you've never seen it. You need to pray over it, ask the Lord to help you understand it, the Spirit to lead you in it, because I promise you, we've been revealing now for almost seven years from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And it's the same story over thousands and thousands of hours of studies and teachings. The fourth video is going to reveal to you how this was all missed. And it's called, It's All Because of Matthew. It's a big teaching, about two hours and 45 minutes. And within it, you're going to first understand that it wasn't yet the time. The reason it wasn't understood for centuries before is because the Lord had it reserved for the final generation to prepare a people. And what you're going to notice is we've all, for hundreds and hundreds of years, have been taught in a foundational understanding from the Gospel of Matthew. That is the answer to having missed 
that the tribulation is a period of 50 days and a small portion or sorry is 14 years and a small portion of 50 days that comes first once you start to understand this once you you seek and search it out i promise you everything you've started to seek and search out in trying to understand prophecy will open up to you i promise you we don't have all the answers but we have hundreds and hundreds of answers to questions that people have had and didn't even know yet to have that's how powerful it is all right so that's where we always recommend everybody to start is in the intro series we believe it is this year we've got videos explaining it this one is a great one um, we've got others as well this 2024 year is the end of 70 years from when they came into the land for which people will say are you smoking something it can't be the end they they came into the land in 1948 well what you have to understand is that's not how it began right you have to understand leviticus chapter 19 23 through 25 when you come into the land you have to plant all manner of trees so they came into the land 1948 they planted all manner of trees in February of 1949. Then they can begin to count, but they're the house of Judah. And accession and non-accession, we've got studies on that. When you realize that they're the house of Judah, they don't begin their count of their kings until the Feast of Trumpets, 1949. Well, just consider what Israel did this year when they proclaimed that they were now 76 years right in the land. When you understand it didn't begin in 1948 in May, but it began in 1949 at the Feast of Trumpets, which is, was September or October, then not only are they not in the 76th, they're in the 75th right now. They're, you see, if they celebrated 76, which they did, plus it's now a couple or so months in, then those couple of months mean they're in their 77th. So if it's 76 in a couple months, which means they're in their 77th, then really they're what? They're in their 75th. Hello. And there's a couple months left in it. Because of the difference. You have to understand how to count these things. And Leviticus 19 is the part that tells us when they come into the land, then plant all manner of trees, then three years, they can't take from it. The fourth year, they're to give it to the Lord. And the fifth year, then it's theirs. You count this out. And we are right now in the 75th year which means 74 plus the time frame which is what uh we're about 60 something days out 60 oh 70 days from the feast of trumpets so we're just a little over two months from the feast of trumpets which is the end of 70 years in the biblical count you see this is something we have studied since this ministry started the whole world was looking at 70 years from 2017 into 18. When it came and went, everybody that was talking about it stopped. But for some reason, the Spirit put it on my heart to keep seeking and searching it out. Did we get it right away? No, it took a while because we were a little excited about how we were counting Leviticus uh, 19. This year that we're in right now, that has 70 days to the Feast of Trumpets is the literal end of that biblical count. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? For those of you who have been around for a while, I think I just talked about this recently as well, but I'm going to share it again for anybody that's new. Psalms 90 and 10 tells us, the days of our years are 70. And if by reason of strength they're 80, so from 70 to 80, it's 10 years. It says that strength is labor and sorrow, which means travail, trouble, pain, toil, and sorrow, affliction, sorrow, trouble, wickedness. What does that mean? 10 years of tribulation. And then it says, for it is soon cut off. That's a short period of time, about six months. So you've got 10 years, a short period of time, about six months, and we fly away. This has nothing to do with us. This is Revelation 12, 14, which is at mid-trumpets 
ten and a half years into tribulation when they fly away on the wings of an eagle for a time and times and a half. One plus two plus a half, three and a half years. What is this telling you? Fourteen years that begins from what? Seventy. Hello. That's why what I'm telling you is just such a big deal. Because when you realize Luke's portion starts with the pre-trib and it's at the 50 days before the 14 years begin, how much time does that leave us? Oh, about 18 hours, uh, 18 days and 15 hours. That's about the time it leaves us. It's crazy. It's wild to think it's even possible. But when you see everything that's been revealed, it's incredible. Now, why did I decide to start with the 70 on this one when after all that I was telling you, we're going to be going into the baptism? Because I want everybody to be ready. I want everybody to be sure they get baptized now. If you're part of a church that says, oh, we're not doing baptisms till the third weekend in August, go find somewhere else. And if you can't find somewhere else and you've really tried, then talk and you've talked to friends, maybe other Christians in the neighborhood, then go do it yourself. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you evidence that if you've really exhausted all the options and you really want to get it done now. I'm going to show you what you can do, and I'm going to give you the evidence for it in what has happened here in the past. So let me show you why I'm sharing this now and why I, I've, I've brought in the 70 in relation to this time with the baptism. Because I want everybody to know, time's up. Time's up. And, and the first group going pre-trib, they're the ones in Christ. Spirit filled in Christ spirit filled okay listen to this this was what was brought up uh in the forum for those that don't know we also have a forum right here at ministryrevealed.com we have like-minded brothers and sisters from the website you can go into the menu box click on the forum it'll take you a few seconds to sign up i will recommend everybody please at least watch the intro series, get an understanding of what it is that we talk about, that we are a prophetic ministry that watches the prophetic, that teaches and digs into prophecy. We are watching and praying and diligently seeking. Okay? So it helps if you come in having at least an understanding of what it is that we share and what we talk about and, and events going on around the world and prayer requests and everything else so that we can all at least be on mostly the same page <clears throat> so you can come and join us there in the forum and this was reposted in the forum by one of our brothers uh, about a post from a year ago as i said earlier and why it was a big deal and why we spoke about it last year because last year there was also a belief based on the count that last year was 70 and without going into all the details the reason it was believed is because when I did the count, I did it with a year zero on the calendar. Well, we operate in a Gregorian calendar around the world, including when Israel came into the land, including the history books going back to date these things. So when you understand that, the Gregorian calendar doesn't have a year zero, and I went and included a year zero because the sun, moon, and stars do have a year zero, it threw everything off by one year. There is no option for that anymore. There is no additional one-year count in Leviticus. doesn't exist anymore. It's so very important. So this that was posted last year for the reason of 70 years and what happened, as I said earlier, with Kamala, where it appeared she might have been taking over last year but then didn't, have a watch of this. You see what happens here? We talked about this being the number 70, but the 70 isn't quite complete. Well, guess what? The 70 won't be complete for 
the Jews until the Feast of Trumpets 2024, which means from where we are now until Feast of Trumpets, or actually the last day of the year, Elul 29, we're still in the 70th year. Which means between now and then, there's an incomplete 70, and then look what happens to this apple when it's split. This is this has stumped people for a long time. What on earth does a lotus have to do with this silly thing? Now, again, please understand, this is just I pet goat too. People have tried to discern and dissect so much in it. This is not where we spend our energy. We here spend it in the scriptures 99.999% of the time. But every once in a while, you know, things of history, which is also part of scripture generally, and, and events going on in the world, you know, we do show those connections. Well, this is one of those really interesting ones from last year that we shared because it appeared to be the end of 70 or almost when we shared this when Kamala was coming into the picture. Well, we all know what happened with Biden having given his his uh, his speech tonight talking about, you know, I didn't watch it all. I caught maybe the last five, six, seven minutes, but we know he's bowed out of the race and they've now got Kamala who's who is taking over. Well, Biden is apparently going to finish his term, which is about six more months. But a lot of people are concerned that he's not going to finish his term. And if he doesn't finish his term, which is highly likely, and why I'm showing this, because 70 isn't quite finished when the Lotus shows up. Which means it would appear that between now and October 2nd of 2024, before the 70 comes to an end, the Lotus is going to come to fruition. What on earth are you talking about? The Lotus is going to come to fruition. Well, get ready. Kamala's name means the Lotus. Kamala's name is the word meaning Lotus. 70 years coming to an end in 2024, and before it ends, the Lotus comes to full bloom. Who just stepped up to the microphone? The one who's going to run next? Is this because I'm saying, oh, she's going to win the presidency? Nope, that's not at all what I said. This would appear to tell us that before 70 is over, she's going to take over. This is my interpretation. Now, when you add this to why I spoke about it last year, it was because one of our sisters, Tanya, had a dream, as I told you, uh, about 34-ish, 33 or so years ago to now. And the dream was she had seen this woman come to the podium. She didn't know who it was, but she fully saw her face and everything. She came to the podium. And when she came to the podium, her, her face turned into like this demon-looking creature. And all of a sudden, chaos started to erupt. There was earthquakes and, I don't know, volcanoes or something, and the earth started to crack and to rip open. And people were running in chaos and were falling into the, the grounds opening all over the place. She had no idea who this person was. She told her young children at the time about it. She told her family. She told her friends. They all knew about it. She remembered it over all of these years. And when Kamala Harris came to the stage when Biden made her VP and that this sister Tanya saw her for the first time, she fell out of her chair. She said she knew it instantly. That was the woman that she saw standing at the podium now about 33 or so years ago. And here we are. Lotus, Kamala, full bloom before the end of 70. You couldn't even script this stuff. Oh, I know some will say it's, it is scripted. Look. Maybe it is. We don't know what the script is. But we can see all of these things playing out, and now it's happening in our reality? Man, that is pretty wild. You see, because this is another pointer, isn't it? This is another thing that points, because look at what it's telling us. 70. We know the purpose of 70. That's why I opened with showing you 
the importance of 70 and how there is no 70 beyond this year. Wild, wild stuff, man. All right. Let's start going into this in relation to the baptism. And where I want to start is oh you noticed uh this is bible gateway i had to send them an email i don't know what they did but all of my colors and my ability to highlight again is back so thank you bible gateway um i it, it really helps <laughs> when i can use my little visual highlights here for you guys so here we are we're in first corinthians 15 something we've spoken about many times over the years that when it first dawned on me i freaked out because all of our lives we've been told that it was just the 12 apostles and then there was just a group of disciples that followed them well we know what the truth was there were 12 and there were the 12 apostles and there were a group that followed them and then of course there was paul later okay this was extremely powerful and it tells us and gives us a lot more understanding into the gospels Seems weird, right? How can this give you more understanding of the Gospels? Well, when you realize who the 12 are, who the larger amount were, who the apostles represent, and who Paul represents, it all opens up. So, listen to what it says. In verse 4, it says, and he was, so talking about Christ's death and resurrection, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the 12. Who do you think these 12 are? They can't be the apostles because he meets with them later. These were the 12 tribes, the heads of the 12 tribes. You see, there were 20, there's 24 elders in heaven, right? 12 are of the tribes and 12 are the apostles. It turns out that while he was here, there were 12 of, 12 of the tribes and 12 of the apostles as well. Funny how that works, right? Well, what do we see? He meets with the 12, which relate to the tribes. After that... He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain uh, unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. This represents the Mark group, right? This, this group during the time that represents even seals. It's, it's so wild. You can see this larger number in the typology to workers. We've talked about them more as the, as the, the, the workers or the 144. And then what do we see here? After that, you see? This was the key. When I realized they kept saying after that, after that, it dawned on me who these groups were. So in after that, verse 7, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. One born out of due time means what? Like premature, right? He's representing here the bride of Christ. So if we're going Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, then in the end, we're going Luke, the apostles, right? The, the Mark group and the Matthew group. And why am I starting here? Because you start to realize when you, when you studied and understand these differences in the Gospels more, you'll realize this difference of wording that we get within the, the end of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in relation to the resurrection story. And we see here in Matthew, when in relation to the resurrection story, right? We see that uh, his countenance was as lightning in relation to that angel, right? Well, we know Jesus, when he's returning at the end of tribulation, he's coming as lightning from one end unto the other. But because this is relating to the end. So listen to what it says. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We've shared this many times. This is the same wording that you get at the seventh trumpet. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them, to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. So what has happened 
is what I was talking about earlier in that because the whole world for hundreds of years has been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. They read this of being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That entire doctrine and churches have been built on this type of baptizing, like the Baptists, right? This is the way you will get baptized, and if you don't get baptized this way, you get kicked out of the out of their out of ba out of out of the Baptist uh, 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 denomination. You see, the dom the denominations all have some things that are good and some things that are twisted, some things they know yet they won't talk about. This is why everybody should be seeking the word themselves, praying over it, asking the Spirit to lead them, and studying these things themselves like good Bereans. Because you'll notice in Scripture, as we go forward, nobody has been baptized in the, in the New Testament. Nobody was baptized in this way going forward. You see, if you go to Matthew tw chapter 24, which everybody knows is the discourse about the end of days. Look at what we read. They talked, they asked Jesus, um, the, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? This is this discourse. We just did the video on the discourses that show you Luke, Mark, and Matthew. The pre-mid post, this coming and at the end of the end of the world is all about his returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, at which point he will be here with them until the end of the world, which means until the end of the millennial reign. And this coming is the word related to his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, for which he will be here until the end of the millennial reign. So what did we just see them say? What did he just say to them? Or what, what they ask him? End of the end of the world. Well, it just so happens in Matthew chapter 28, he ends with saying in verse 20 at the end of Matthew's gospel, which is prophetically a picture of the end of tribulation when he returns feet down, and he tells them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Now, the world of church, and yes, you can apply this in an is context, that the Lord is with us, he is within us, and with us always, even until the end of the world. Sure. But in the prophetic, in the words being taught, he's talking about the end of the world. Is he actually here right now until the end of the world? No. Where was the other place in Matthew where they asked him when he would come and be here till the end of the world? It's in Matthew's discourse. Funny how that happens, right? Well, look what he tells them to do. To teach all nations. To teach them. Wait a second. Teach them? What about... What about uh, 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 preaching? What about preaching the coming to Messiah? Why weren't these guys given the preaching about coming to Messiah? Does that make any sense to you? Going and teach the ways of the Lord? Go and teach the things that, that he commands them to teach? But there's nothing about remission of sins? Right? Just the things that the Lord tells them to, to obey? Look at who this group is. We see that it's the 11. It says the disciples. But we're in Matthew. So what do we know about this group? Well, we know who they actually are, don't we? It's the first group that he met with. After his resurrection, the first group he met with was the Matthew group. So here we are. He's meeting with the Matthew group. And here is this Matthew group with this wording about him now being here till the end of the world and to get this group to go out and teach the people the ways of the Lord until the end of the world. And it's to teach them what? And teach them and that they would be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Do you realize that this group, which we saw right here, relates to the 12, which are the tribes, and that they're going out until the end of the world is literally the millennial reign. You want to know how we can prove this? 
if we go into the book of Revelation, chapter 21, we see that there were three different groups here. When New Jerusalem comes down at the end of the millennial reign, we see that there were 12 gates. And on the 12 gates had the names of the 12 tribes. To have gates, you need to have walls. And the walls all measured 144. That is the measurement of a man that is of an angel. 144 relates to the workers during trumpets, which are the 144,000. What about seals? Well, if we just follow what it, what it was saying in 1 Corinthians, we see that the 12 being the 12 tribes are the gates through which people are going to come in. This represents the larger group being the 144,000, which represent the walls. And then who do we have? The next group that he meets with are the apostles. So if the apostles come first after the pre-trib, then who are the apostles? They would be the foundation. The city has 12 foundations, and in them, the names of the 12 apostles. There's your 12 apostles and your 12 that represent the tribes, <coughs> which means seals is a is a not only physically laying the foundation, but a spiritual foundation is being laid in the midst of seals. Then you've got the larger group represented as the 144,000, which will be the walls that are being built on the foundations. And when the 14 years of tribulation is over and the, the Lord is returned at the end of trumpets and he has dealt with the enemy, then what does he, what does he tell the 12 to do? He sends the 12 out, as we saw in Matthew 28. He sends them out to teach the ways of the Lord. And when they do, what are they bringing them into? They're going to bring them in through the gates. Foundation laid during seals. The walls are built up and the temple and everything else in trumpets. And in the millennial reign, it's the 12 tribes going out throughout all nations, teaching the ways of the Lord because he's here now with them till the end of the world. And they're leading them in to the Lord through the gates. So when you when you look at Matthew 28, you have to say to yourself, why is this baptism of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost only discussed one time in Scripture? And it's in Matthew's Gospel at the end when he's talking about having all power in heaven and in earth like the seventh trumpet only going out to teach the people and yet not preaching. Why would there not be preaching? Because he's here. Because he's here, just as they asked in Matthew 24. It would be at when is when is your coming end of the end of the world? This is his coming, and now he's here till the end of the world, so they don't need to preach Christ. They're only going to teach him. And so when they're going out during the millennial reign, they're going to be baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you might say, why would they be baptizing during the millennial reign? What might be the point of that? Well, we'll tie that in to the very end of today's teaching. Now we go to Mark. Look at Mark's. We go to the end of Mark's gospel and his resurrection, and we see the commission that Mark's group is given. In the prophetic, this relates to the end of seals and going into the time of trumpets. And it relates to which group, right? It relates now to this larger portion being the 144, and it's which was also connected in Revelation 12, the 144, and then the great multitude. So it has a, this combined connection in that. And listen to what he says. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and unbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is preach. This isn't, this isn't teaching. This is preaching. And then listen to what this says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. We're going to get to this in a little bit. You see, why 
You see, they, they believe and be baptized. And they'll be saved. But if they don't believe, they're going to be damned. Which means they must believe, but they don't have to be baptized. What? Isn't everything I'm telling you about now about being baptized? Yet in relation to Mark's, you must believe. Because if you don't believe, you're damned. But... You can be baptized, but if you're not, it's okay as long as you believe. Funny how that happens, right? And then what does he say? <clears throat> and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If anything, uh, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay their hands on the sick, and shall they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now, we have taught. Who does this relate to? It relates to the workers, the 144, that will be sealed at the end of the sixth year of seals to start the seventh year. And they're the ones receiving this power and this authority. But they were the ones who didn't believe Christ was coming, who who didn't believe the testimony of those that were working during seals. You see? And they're going to preach, and there's baptizing, but there isn't this full necess necessity of baptizing. Why is that? Well, remember, these guys are going to be going out during trumpets, but they're also helping the seals group bring in the great multitude rapture before they go out and begin the seven years of trumpets that come after. But you see this different wording. Preach, not teach. To be baptized, uh, to believe and be baptized, but you can believe and not, uh, uh, you can believe and be saved even if you're not baptized. Yet everything I'm about to show you next tells you about being baptized. Why does it become so much more important when we go forward in the day and age that we're living in right now? Because what happens next? Well, if you follow, that means he met with the Matthew group first, then he met with the Mark group, then he met with the apostles, which relates to John's gospel, and then also me of out of due time, which is the pre-trib. Now, the pre-trib doesn't only cover the pre-trib, those born out of due time. It represents the remnant bride remaining to serve the Lord. Okay? So, from those going pre-trib, there's a, there's a group which are the elect of God, chosen from before the foundation of the earth, out of his will, that will be chosen from among them to remain and serve during seals. Now, for those that don't know, what we just saw in Revelation 20, 20 was there were the 12 that represented the gates. There was the 144,000 that represented the walls. There was the 12 apostles that represented the foundation. So how on earth is there another group from this one? And without going too far down that, we've talked about it a number of times, it relates to that remnant group that I told you are of the elect, which we're going to be talking about and how this connects going forward. We see them, and their portion isn't that portion of New Jerusalem coming down. Their portion is ruling and reigning with Christ for the millennial reign. They take part in the first resurrection of the dead. They have part in the first resurrection. They're the only ones on such. The second death has no, no, no power. So you don't see them in Revelation 21 coming down as the foundation, the walls, and the gates. But you see them in chapter 20. They were there ruling and reigning with Christ who will sit in his throne with him as he sits in his fathers with his during the millennial reign. So when we go back into Luke's understanding this, in the prophetic, look at what happens. Jesus has appeared unto them. He sat down, served them, and ate with them. 
he opened up their understanding to these things in the in in the books of the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. He opened unto them their understanding. You see, very different than Mark and Matthew, and said unto them, "Thus it is ri written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins." should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are my witnesses. Okay? Very different wording than Mark and very different wording than Matthew. You know what you don't see here? Baptizing. Why don't we have baptizing? There should be baptizing, right? Because from this point in the is, so if you go, if you, once you understand the was, is, and is to come, the was is from creation to Christ, the is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, from the pre-trib to the end is the is to come, was, is, and is to come. So in the is of the way church would read Luke right now, they would read this, and we know that from Luke, it then goes into the book of Acts. And then, of course, there is baptism on the 50th day. Right? So they, they receive the Holy Ghost, but then there's also baptism, right? We see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which we're going to get to. So in the is of life, that means from Christ until the moment of the, of the pre-trib, there is baptism taking place. There, there is water baptism with repentance and remission of sins. So it is repentance, remission of sins with the water baptism that we're going to touch on in Acts. And that's the baptism, as you're going to see as we go forward, that is all throughout the scriptures. We'll touch on a few of them as we go into it. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be taking place all throughout the New Testament after the Lord was gone. You see, so the first thing I want to do, or the two things that I want to do, is have you understand that we are not, for one, to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It has nothing pertaining to us. There's a reason why it's only in the Gospel of Matthew. We are all to be baptized in Jesus' name. For the remission of the sin, of, for the remission of sins, and to receive the Holy Ghost. In baptism. It's all throughout the New Testament. So in the is, that's what we're living in. So I want to show people that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost baptism. If you've been baptized in that, it has nothing to do with us. It is not for us. We are born again through Christ's death and resurrection. We are to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and the receiving of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, are the ones that go first. They're the portion to the spirit. And the other piece I want people to know is that baptism by water is a necessity. It is important. Whether, whether you, you are not able to get fully wet somehow, but you can do something if you're, if you're in some third world nation and there's just no water and you're so concerned and you want to do it now, then where, wherever you can find or go to water and be baptized, do it. I'm sure there's something somewhere, some sort of pond or lake or something, and get baptized. You're going to see it's full water immersion. And there's a reason for it. I want people to know because I don't want anybody left behind from anybody who's heard our teachings before the pre-trib happens. I want to make sure everybody is baptized in Jesus' name as we're going to get to in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Because that is the access into the kingdom of God, third heaven and i'm going to show that to you as well 
You must be spirit-filled. It is absolutely important. So, not like Matthew 28, and don't listen to those that say you don't need to be water baptized. What if, what if maybe you didn't need water baptism, and great, you were spirit-filled and you got there and you made the pre-trip? Well, that'd be wonderful. But what if water baptism was part of it for anybody that studied the scriptures and saw it and then decided not to do it, though it's everywhere in scripture, and decided not to do it because they just thought, well, no, it's, that's not really the meaning. Though people were actually dunking in water and you decided not to and that was the requirement or a requirement. How would you feel then? Not worth waiting, is it? Now, we've been talking here in the prophetic of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What you're going to notice here in the Luke prophetic, like we just did in Matthew and Mark, you'll notice there is no baptism. You see? There is no baptism. So if we look at the last chapter of Mark, the last chapter, uh, sorry, the last chapter of Luke, the last chapter of Mark, the last chapter of Matthew, we could see portions of when there is a need, when there isn't a need, and when it's going to change. What do we see in Luke's? No mention of baptism. No mention of baptism. We go to Mark's, and there was a mention of baptism. And we go to Matthew's, and there is a mention of baptism, but it's in a different way in relating to the Lord here till the end of the world. So in the prophetic... What's the reason for Luke not mentioning baptism here? You see, if he met with the Matthew group first and then met with the Mark group, and in the Mark group he did talk about the, the baptism in Jesus' name, and then he gets to the Luke group and he doesn't, why would he have mentioned it to these guys first and then not mention it to this? There's a reason prophetically why these things are laid out the, the way they are in the differences of the Gospels. And the reason for Luke's is because this, you see, you are witnesses. This relates to the two on the road to Emmaus. This represents the Luke group, the remnant workers, as the, 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 um, the Moses Elijah types that are going to work during the time of seals. That's the prophetic picture. That's why when you come to Mark, you end up seeing where it says that Jesus appeared in another form unto two of them. Well, that's the two. He appears in another form prophetically here at the end of Mark being the end of seals. And here comes the 144,000 to be sealed to help them out and then to go work during trumpets. Why would you have these guys here coming to these guys, if in Luke, the very first group that he meets with is this group and there's no mention of these guys? How could it all be the same groups of people? It wasn't. That's why 1 Corinthians is so important. And in the prophetic, the reason why he doesn't mention baptism is because in the prophetic, this is the group that goes out to work during the tribulation of seals. And when they go out, you see, they're being, they're being given understanding by the Lord, right? They're the ones putting their necks on the line. They're going to take part in the resurrection of the just that we just saw in Revelation 20. They're going to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. This is who they represent. John's are the, the, the 12 apostles. Mark's are the larger number. And Matthews are the 12. And those three are all mentioned, as we said, in chapter 21. This is the Luke group, and it's represented by Revelation chapter 20, those who will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And here he is opening their understanding and then telling them what's going to happen. So he's here with them for 40 days. And when the 40 days are over, they wait not many days, about three days. And then they're anointed by the Holy Ghost on the 50th. And then only theirs tells them that they're going to begin from Jerusalem because Jerusalem will be compassed about and destroyed. So they will have gone out from Jerusalem, but that's where it's going to begin for them. So 
What's going to happen during seals? Well, when you know it's going to begin with the destruction of Jerusalem and World War III, the Red Horse Rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, how is everybody going to get saved needing to be baptized to receive the Holy Ghost? They won't be able to. <clears throat> you see? They're not going to be able to during the tribulation of seals. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, right? Neighbor against neighbor, city against city. That's, that's the way tribulation is going to begin. And it's going to be the first two and a half years. Then they're going to have to flee into the wilderness when, it's, when the beast gets his power to continue go in that 42 months. And the mark of the beast comes. That's when they got to flee. <clears throat> they go flee into the wilderness in the mountains. How is anybody crying out to Christ at that point going to be easily able to go and get baptized? They're not going to be able to. So what do we understand in the prophetic of Luke's uh, gospel at the end? The reason for no conversation of baptism is because it won't be required during the end of days in seals. Do you get it? It won't be required. And we're going to be able to prove to you why in the end of days it's not required. Because those going at the mid-trib great multitude rapture, they're not going to the same place those who are spirit-filled went. They're not going to the third heaven. They're going to paradise. You see, but where are we now? Now, in our day and age, what are we living in? We're living in the is. We are still in the is. You know, we show this in relation to the seven churches. We are right now in the Laodicean age. As soon as the pre-trib happens, the seven churches begin again, as we've taught. So until they begin again, we are currently in the is age <clears throat> of Laodicea. Which is, by the way, the time of Judah's kings. Huh? Who's in the land? Judah's kings, right? It is the house of Judah that's in the land. Not Israel. Israel scattered around the world. As soon as the pre-trip happens, then it will begin all over again which means we are still currently living in the new testament life right which means we should be what that people are going out preaching repentance right so and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached and then what happened from luke we go into acts <clears throat> they followed him for 40 days teaching of the things of the kingdom of god they waited not many days, which is three days, and then true Pentecost comes, and the Holy Ghost comes down, and when they receive the Holy Ghost, everybody thinks they're drunken and everything else, and what do we read? We come down to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and it tells us right here, then Peter said unto them, repent comma, and, so in addition to, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So what? Repent, remission of sins, and in the is, also being baptized. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the baptism. That is happening all throughout the New Testament. Baptized. What does baptized mean? Fully wet. Fully wet. And we'll talk on that a little bit more when we talk about maybe difficulties that can occur with trying to get baptized. Okay? This is the baptism that I am talking to each and every one of you out there. 
that if you were baptized already, some say, you know, some come from families, you know, like myself, I was, I, I was born and raised in a Catholic church family. I stopped going when I was 13, and then I came to be born again when I was 24. I was kind of, you know, in and out until later in life, and then was fully committed. And I was rebaptized. You see, many people that come from Catholicism were baptized when they're babies, and they think, oh, well, I was baptized. You had no idea you were baptized. You were put a little water on your head and somebody else, you know, claimed you were baptized. No, this is you baptized. This is you claiming it for yourself with the full knowledge and understanding of what you're talking about. You see, or others have been baptized in the Matthew 28 way. Or maybe you haven't been baptized because you've been of the belief that it's not necessary. I am telling you right now, every one of you in those situations Make an appointment, however you need to, to get baptized in Luke chapter 2, verse 38. Everybody. Because you're going to see in the, I'm not going to go into every scripture, but you're going to see a number of scriptures pertaining to all of these people who were literally baptized having received the Holy Ghost. What do you think that means? What's the importance of it? Why why is it different than a group who will just proclaim Christ and believe? The difference in our day and age right now, living in the is and about to go into the is to come, the difference is pre-trib and mid-trib. You heard that. The difference is pre-trib versus mid-trib. Repentance, remission of sins, baptized in Jesus' name, or repentance and believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and waiting until the seventh year of seals. Great multitude rapture. Your place will be in that of light instead of that of spirit. Oh yes, there's a difference, my friends. There is a difference. It is all those going first who are in Christ spirit filled. Those who remain and will will either fall away and many, many in the greatest revival in human history will come to receive Christ, will be able to come to Christ and receive him in the end of days by simply claiming his name. Do you know that that's also happened in the is throughout the last 2000 years as well? Do you know that there were those who were, who were baptized having received the Spirit in Christ that are right now in the third heaven? Whereas there are others who were not baptized yet claimed Christ and believed on Him that are right now in paradise where the great multitude mid-trib rapture group goes? Do you remember that in Luke's Gospel? Uh, Luke... I think 23, watch this. Luke 23. Right here. So remember the, the two on each side of Jesus? A lot of people wonder who was on the left side, who was on the right side. Well, the guy on the right side is the one that accepted Jesus. And we read right here that, um, let's go from verse 40. Luke 23, verse 40. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in... The third heaven? Nope. Paradise. He told him he would be with him in paradise. Why didn't this guy get to go to the third heaven? He hadn't received the Spirit. He hadn't been baptized. It's, it's like those in the midst of tribulation that will declare Christ as their Lord and Savior and be beheaded for it. You see, a lot of people will come to Christ, declare Christ, 
might be taken will stand strong and stand firm on the declaration of Christ, just like this guy did on the cross, be beheaded, and where will they go? Paradise. Paradise. There was no chance, no time for this guy to be water baptized. Somebody on their deathbed giving their life to Christ, realizing they had made a mistake and they pondered these things on their deathbed and they gave themselves over to Christ in the final moments. Paradise. That's the second group. The first group is all about the kingdom of God in the third heaven. And everywhere it tells us in the New Testament of being baptized, and it is always in Jesus' name that is being discussed. In 1 Corinthians 15 again, we see this right here, this time going from verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which you also have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures what does this have to do with us in relation to what baptism is all about you're going to see when we get to it uh, a little bit further on back here in fact you know what since i'm on it right here i'm going to bring it up right here listen to what this says let's go to romans a great book in all this see we did a i did a, a three video teaching Almost nine hours of breaking down the book of Romans over three teachings, almost nine hours. It was crazy. It is all about those who go pre-trib and the remnant from among them who remain to serve the Lord, spirit-filled in Christ. Listen to what Romans 6 says. Starting in... Uh, let's start in verse 3. It says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death. Hello. It is the act of being water covered, being whether submerged or if you can't, you know, to the best of your ability, but being what? Fully wet, dying in yourself and rising a new man. The old man is dead in that water. That, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, in Christ, baptized in the act of dying to ourselves, the old man dying in the water, and the new man being raised up out of it. Why would it be in Romans? Why would it be in the book of Romans if, if it wasn't necessary after Christ? Why would it be all throughout the book of Acts and going forward throughout many decades? It, it doesn't make any sense, does it? For people to say, oh, baptism isn't necessary? <clears throat> well, here's the video that we did. So you can see this video here. Uh, it was done March 18th, 2020. So over four years ago when we did this. So if you want to watch it, you can start at about this point, like the 32 or so minute mark. You can start watching it. He goes into this, we have a, a pastor that came on, and he goes into talking about this, that what we just read in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which to us equals repentance, 
the burial as the baptism, so the death as the repentance, so the death to self, turning from those things, doing a 180 on those things that that were that are sinful, that that cause us to be dead, and then burial, which is the equivalent of us being baptized, as I just spoke about that we saw in Romans 6, that the old man dies in that water and the new one rises up. And the resurrection, when that new man rises up, what do you receive? It's the receiving of the gift, which is that gift of the Holy Ghost. It is the gift of the Holy Ghost. And obviously, it's very important for us to have that. Because if you're looking to be pre-trib, in Christ, spirit-filled, it's a requirement. Let me go to a piece here. Uh, we'll watch... Uh, a minute or two, maybe a little over two minutes, and listen carefully to what he says. Let's have a listen. Verse 15, and while you're getting there, I want to start explaining. Oh, give me a sec. I was listening at double speed. <laughs> All right. The word repent. It's the Greek word is metanoia, and it's the Psalms number is G3340. And it means to think differently or afterward to change your mind, change the inner man. Mm -hmm. So so we've got to we've got to gain this understanding that repentance, especially for example in the old testament, when you find the word repent mm -hmm. and you do the root search of repent, it means to turn back. Yeah. Turn back. Because the, the, the people the children of Israel were with God at one point and they turned away. And so they were called to repentance, which meant to turn back. That's right. So when I'm when I'm preaching in churches, I like to a lot of times if I'm up on the stage, I'll start walking one to one side, maybe to the left, and I'll say, Look, when I change my mind and repent, I turn and go the other way. And this is this is another example I use for people to help them understand. When Alan and I decided to do this little video together and to get this understanding, to get more ministry revealed when it comes to repentance and remission of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit. When, when I agreed to do this with Alan, I could have called Alan and said, hey, brother, I've had a change of mind. And mm -hmm. he, said, he would say, okay, well, would I be here doing this video right now? No. 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 <laughs> Why? Because every time you change your mind, it results in a change of action. That's right. So if I repent and I, and I turn away from my sin, it will re result in a change of action. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see how God doesn't just leave that up to us. He gives us help uh, in doing that. So we've got to... You see... Because repentance is a change of action. And a lot of people, you see, what do people get caught up with? So if you guys want to come see this, it was about four, a little over four years ago. And it's this video title right here. You see, a lot of people, one of the other things that gets people all caught up is they think for some crazy reason that being baptized is works. Could you imagine the foolishness of that? I'm sorry if that offends some of you guys. It is absolutely foolishness to think that being baptized is a work. It has nothing to do with works. It's the rest of the story that you have to finish within yourself. You see, what did it say right here? Repent, comma, and, meaning in, de in, in addition to repentance, which is, to think differently, to reconsider, to turn and go in another direction, meaning you're not going in the same direction to do those same things that you were doing. You're doing that and. So a comma and, meaning a separate action, but also included in it, is being baptized. You see? Yet, yet you have some people that have this crazy notion that baptism is, is, is a work. They've been so twisted in thinking that every single thing they do is a work, that they tell everybody, no, 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 that's works, that's works. You know, it, it's so strange. It's just the rest of the story. Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. Let the old man die off and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Wild the way some people think it means, what they think it means. But you know what's interesting about that? is when you realize that those who get it and are truly water baptized, that, that get baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins, you, you could see as you understand what we talk about here in the prophetic that the revelation shows us 
there are some apportioned to the third heaven. And there's a much larger portion that is apportioned to paradise. Not everybody's going to get it. Not everybody, it would appear, was supposed to get it. Now, did, did the Lord want everybody to get it? Sure. But he knows everything from the beginning. So it's not that he made certain people not get it. It's that he knew some people wouldn't get it. But you're also going to see something else. There is a group of people within groups of people that he has appointed from the foundation of the earth. It's literally in the conversation of this. You'll see it when we get there. Now, let me show you this. I was talking about self-baptism, right? So if you don't have that ability to be baptized, I had spoken in, I think it was in this video, or it must have been just shortly before. Remember what ended up happening at this time, guys? COVID, right? COVID had come in, so everybody was locked in their homes. Well, if you're locked in your homes and you're single and you're not able to go in and out, well, you don't necessarily know you're going to live tomorrow. You, you can get very nervous and not have been baptized, but you want to be baptized. You don't want to miss out. So do you think that if you've exhausted your avenues to truly be baptized by somebody in Christ and you have no other option, do you think the Lord would not allow you to take a bath purposely for baptism or to take a shower if you don't have a tub and purposely jump in the shower for a baptism, do you not think the Lord would grant you that as a baptism, even though you're doing it yourself? Well, I was speaking about that, about people having the option to do that if they've exercised these other options and they weren't able to get it done any other way. But you don't treat it like a shower. You don't treat it like a bath. You don't say, okay, well, I'm going to just go in, take a shower, but I'm going to baptize myself first and then just finish my shower. No, you treat it like an absolute baptism if this is your only option. You have a t-shirt on, maybe a pair of shorts, whatever the case may be. We, we've got, you know, you speak uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 over yourself, right? You, you pray, you go in, you pray that over yourself, and you step out, turn the water off, shut the door, or drain the tub, dry off, and be truly baptized in this sense of doing it yourself. Now, why do I say this is even possible? It sounds pretty absurd to say you can do it yourself. Well, the Lord knows your heart. And knowing your heart, if you've exhausted these other options and you want to get it done right away, listen to what happened from our sister Renee. She, she wrote me this back about four years ago. She says, after watching the video you had on baptism for the remission of sins, in the name of Jesus Christ, I instantly had a feeling I needed to be baptized. Being that I am alone now, I baptized myself. The Holy Spirit then guided me. I felt the Spirit, and I fell to my knees, and I asked the Lord for forgiveness for all of my sins and prayed for a while. Then I went to my sink, filled three glasses of water, and poured them over my head as I prayed, Dear Lord, I baptize myself with you as my witness for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to what she said next. Instantly, I felt a tingling through, through my whole body. I walked over to my door to look up to the sky. I started to speak in tongues, which I have never done. It was uncontrollable, and even if I would try to stop, I couldn't. I began to shake and cry uncontrollably. I felt this for a long time. Then a feeling of peace fell over me. Don't tell me if you truly mean it in your heart that you can't do it. That was evidence right there. Does it mean everybody that does it will speak in tongues? No. Did I speak in tongues? No. Have I ever spoken in tongues? Never. It doesn't mean I'm not baptized. It doesn't mean I'm not filled with the Spirit in Christ. 
the requirement isn't having to speak in tongues. You see, it's being obedient to his word. You see, there's a change happens. You have to repent. You have to want it. You have to desire him. That's what we're talking about. That's what's happening. Look what happens in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. You see, so what are we doing now? We've been talking about all this in relation to baptism in the is that we are still currently in. We are in the is of this Laodicean age, and it includes being water baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins in repentance and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. Because the first group going is spirit. All right? Let's go to another one. Let's see. Acts verse 9. This is going to take us off into another little trail. Let's go into Acts verse 9 and see another place of this. This is about Paul. Okay? We all know the story about Paul, uh, whose name was Saul, of course. He was making his way, and then all of a sudden, the Lord appears unto him as light. He's blinded, right? So we'll start here. Uh, let's start in verse 9. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, <laughs> Imagine, guys, this is the type of stuff coming. For that remnant worker group, that will be in Christ, that, that are his remnant bride in Christ, spirit-filled, staying to serve him, that are, that are his remnant bride. You're even going to see that again tonight. They're, they're the Ananias types, these disciples. The Lord just speaks to him, and he's like, I'm here, Lord. And then, boom, he starts talking to him. That's what's coming. That's what's coming and beyond for this remnant worker group. But now back to the is that we're living in. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for, the, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered the Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the pre chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. You see, what is he representing? Those those serving during the Gentile age. We know the Gentile age doesn't end until the end of seals. So Paul is a chosen vessel, right? Remember what we just saw in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, we know he met with the Matthew group, the Mark group, the John group, and then the Luke group. The Luke group is the pre-trib represented as Paul being one born out of due time, meaning premature. Before she travailed, she gave birth, as we've shared on many times, where the ministry began on September 8th, officially, of 2017. That the Isaiah 66, verse 7, to Revelation 12, verse 2, the pre-trib connection. This is who Paul represents, who represents the Luke group going before it all begins. Watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. But he's also now here representing what? A chosen vessel. So he's representing the Luke group as the pre-trib spirit-filled group, but he's also representing what? A chosen 
vessel who is to serve the Lord. So let's see what Paul, representing the Luke group as a pre-trib who is gone, but in this case now representing that chosen from among them to serve the Lord. He's called what? A chosen vessel. I'm going to start with this word vessel very quickly. We've seen it before. We've spoken about it before. Listen to this. Specifically a wife as contributing to the usefulness of her husband. Hello. We know that he represents the Luke group. The pre-trib went as the that bride of Christ and a remnant portion who is going to be who are going to be his chosen vessels to serve him who are representing his wife as those contributing to his usefulness. Pretty wild, right? Well, what about the word chosen? Let's look at this word chosen. Divine selection. It's only used seven times. Let's have a look at where it's used. In relation to the book of Acts, that's where it happens the first time and only time in the book of Acts. Then we've got it in Romans 9, Romans 11. Romans 11. We've talked on this. I just spoke about earlier how I've got the three-part series, almost nine hours on the book of Romans, and the book of Romans is all to who? The pre-trib, those who will be in Christ, spirit-filled, and those chosen from among them to remain to serve the Lord. And it just so happens, look at the election. It's in Romans. And look where else. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll get to that in a moment. So, let's go see in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We see one right here. Okay, in chapter 9, verse 11. So it says, starting in verse 11, and then we'll scroll down further. It says, for the children not yet born. So actually, let's start in verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father, father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that uh, but of him that calleth listen to this it's come down here actually let's go do this in esord romans chapter 9 and we'll come back to acts in a moment in in this wording breakdown listen to what this says so in verse 9 and that he might make known okay Remember, he's going to give understanding and make known something, right? Something that we talked about from Luke, right, in, in chapter 24. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of his mercy, which he had afore prepared, which he had ordained before, ordained before which he had fit up in advance. Verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. The Gentile bride and the Gentile remnant who will serve. As he saith also in Osi or Hosea, I've got one brother that always gets me on there. Hosea, all right? Um, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. We talked about uh, Hosea, the 14 chapters, the 14 years to Zechariah, right? One to the Gentiles, one to the Jews. So what's he talking about? A vessel, this, this wife who is going to serve him, who was known in advance for ordained. Well, look what happens. It sounds pretty like, it sounds a little over the top, right? So you go to you go to uh, Romans 11, and we've seen this in Romans 11, okay? So we're talking about these vessels. We're talking about the um, those be, uh, prepared in advance. And look at what Romans chapter 11 says. And then we're going to see more of what's connected to them. So... We see right here, starting in verse uh, 
let's start verse 11. We know that this connection is to Elijah with the Elijah company at the end of days, which are the seals workers. 11 verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? He's talking about Elijah when he says, I'm the only one that left. Uh, that's left. He says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Okay. And then what does the Lord say? Even so then, at this present time, there is also, right, a remnant according to the, there's that word again, used seven times, according to the election of grace. Now, who is this remnant? Look at this remnant. It's a remainder, which means from among those who are his bride, the, the Gentiles, there is a remnant that he has chosen from among them, even in this present time. A group who will remain. And this group that will remain comes from the Greek word to leave. Okay? It could be a negative thing. It could be a positive thing. Right? Now, watch where this leads to, and then we're going to come back to the election. Watch where this leads. The Greek word G007. It's only used out of the gospel out of all the gospels. It's only used in Luke 18. Remember, I told you a little earlier there's gonna be like a little deviation midway, approximately. A little bit past midway, okay? Right here. Luke 18, chapter 22, that is connected to this remnant left behind who's part of the election. So let's go see what Luke 18 says. Luke 18, verse 22. Now, remember who he's talking to, right? This is in relation to the rich ruler. But we're going to fit it into the context of the prophetic as well as everything's about to begin. Yes, we're still talking about the baptism as well. It says in 22, but this is a little sidetrack, right? Um, 18, verse 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto them, remember, he, he's, let, actually, let's go back a bit. Let's start in verse 19. This is about the rich ruler, right? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Uh, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept um, from my youth up. So this guy, wow, this rich ruler seems to have really got his things together <clears throat> because he's kept all these things from his youth under this point. You would think, <clears throat> excuse me, he, he's ready to follow the Lord, right? He wants to call a master to inherit eternal life. He wants to be part of this group, of this group. But listen to what it says in 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto them, unto him, yet lackest. You see, it's generally used in a negative tone that something is lacking. But the thing that's lacking is because, in this case, his riches. And you're going to understand why it's in Luke and what this connection has to do to this remnant group, which will remain. Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Yikes, right? And when he had heard this, he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? You see, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? You could be doing all of these things. And then he says, hey, if you want to follow me, we're talking now in the prophetic, this remnant group for the end of days. But you're not willing to give up these comforts of the world that you're enjoying with your riches to follow me. So then are you really mine? Do you really want to follow me? You see, why do I bring this up? One it's because I was led into this as this connection, <coughs> excuse me, in this conversation of the importance of baptism. 
for everybody pre-trib and the remnant that will remain. Because this is also part of it as we see how it's connected in the storyline. And we see this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this same conversation of context in Luke chapter 12. Remember what he tells them with the little flock. So this is that prophetic picture of the Lord having a conversation with the Luke remnant group, with this bride portion who remains, when he tells them to be ready when he turns when he returns from the wedding. And look at what he tells them. <clears throat> Let's start in verse 29. And seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. Okay? In the end, guys, we're going to be relying 100% on the Lord. For all things... Do the nations of the world seek after? And your father knoweth that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. Okay, the remnant group. Fear not, little flock, for this, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Remember those who are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years? Listen to what he's going to tell them. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see this connection? Its connection is also to this remnant group. And I felt I needed to bring this up. Not because I doubt anybody here has so much wealth that when the Lord comes and here you are a part of this ministry and, and he's choosing the people and he's going to appear to them and let them know these things. Are anybody here? Is anybody here going to be, uh, I don't know if I could do that, Lord. I'm watching. I'm praying. I'm diligent. I'm seeking. I'm searching. But, Lord, you want me to give all that up now? I don't think that will be an issue here. But I felt I needed to bring it up. So that it's like this baptism conversation. That anything that we're not prepared for, whether somebody isn't yet baptized or in the proper baptism, or somebody is maybe a, a, a little leery or off, as to what it might cost them. Well, it'll cost everything on this earth. I'm not saying you give it all up now. Please don't do that. I am not the one telling you. It will be the Lord when he comes. Who will tell all of the disciples. All who he has chosen. To sell off their things. And to give alms. It will be distributed among those who will need to go out and serve. For whatever those works will be in the time of seals when they're being sent out and the rest you know given to poor and given to help out others that's coming and i want to make sure you're prepared just as so many people have been blessing the ministry in helping us throughout the years and helping in uganda so that more people can be reached in christ and because of the revelation that they have in uganda through the ministry here they're reaching them in salvation in water baptism, and in preparation for the end of days. So if anybody's thinking, you know, maybe it'd be good to help out more now so we can bring more in before it all starts, feel free to do that. We have the PayPal in the links below and on the website and so forth. But no, I am not telling you to sell everything that you have, all right? The Lord will make that known to the remnant workers when the time comes. But I want you to all know this and be aware of it with this little time left so that you're prepared and don't get caught like the rich man in Luke's story. Doing all of these things, watching, praying, diligently, seeking and searching as we are, a, a remnant being prepared only to say, I don't know, Lord. Do I think that's going to happen to you guys? As I said a moment ago, of course not. I don't think that even for the slightest bit possible with anybody here. But 
It was where I was led, and I felt maybe there is one or two. I don't know, right? I don't know, but that's where I was led, so I felt I had better share that. So now let's go back into Romans chapter 11. We see this uh, even actually in, uh, as we were seeing in Acts chapter 9, we saw that it was with uh, Paul and him being baptized, right? So remember, we're still going to go back to this because he's a chosen vessel. So actually, let's go back into Acts 9. You're going to see it's going to lead us here anyways. In Acts chapter 9, so not only is he a vessel and what ends up happening to him, we see here in, in 17 and 18, uh, actually, let's start in 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hands on him, uh, on him, sorry, said, da, 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 and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, comma, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been, scales, and he received uh, sight forthwith, and he arose and left, and went on his merry way. He was baptized. He arose and was baptized. Well, we're talking years down the road, right? This is years down the road after the death and resurrection of Christ. If baptism wasn't important, uh, why is everybody doing it? And why Paul? If Paul is a picture of the Luke group, if Paul is the represented pre-trib, and then this chosen vessel as a representation of the remnant workers who are not only the vessels as those of a bride, of a wife, and the contributing to their husband, but we also see that they're chosen, which is the election, the chosen. You see, Act Romans 9, Romans 11 that we were just talking about, this remnant portion, we see who this remnant group is. This remnant group will be that group that will need to give everything up to go and follow him. You see why I went there now? Well, who is this group? Who is this chosen group? Well, we've been showing who they were the whole time. Paul is representing them. They're represented in Romans, which is all about those like Luke, represented as the Luke group, who are the pre-trib and the remnant from the pre-trib that are his remnant bride. So, look at what it says about them. You ready for this? I want you to realize this isn't me saying it. I'm reading of what this, sa this says right here. So, this is for the Greek word, um, G1589, which is the word for those chosen or the election, okay? Those who will remain to serve the Lord. Listen to what it says. The act of picking out, choosing, listen to this, of the act of God's free will by which before the foundation of the world, he decreed his blessings to certain persons. What? You see, some people say, oh, oh, so you guys are this, but everybody else, they don't get it. So there's somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Am I saying it? No, I'm reading it. The decree made from choice by which he determined to bless certain persons through Christ by grace alone. Everybody? No. Certain people. Certain people. By God's own free will from before the foundation of the earth. pretty wild right did did i make that up did, did i say through through this this uh before the foundation of the world no do you know what came before the foundation of the world 
Do you know where it all began? What came from the beginning? Christ. Something we've taught on, right? When I said earlier, if you're newer to the ministry, when you heard me say from Genesis, beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, we have covered it. The revelation of the end of days of the 50 and 14 years and really the 777 of which the first seven is preparation, but only the last 50 days are the key. And then seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets and then the final jubilee. What is it? It's the revelation of the, of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters, 777. 22 is the jubilee. It's, it's the new beginning. It's all of creation. And what does the world tell us about Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2? They call it gap theory. They think it may account for the billions of years that scientists try to tell us came first. It doesn't. But do you know what the world of Matthew tells us? That the whole world is only 6,000 and then the millennial reign, 7,000 years. That's wrong too. And we've proven it with scripture that when the story is all over, it will have been 22,000 years at the end of the millennial reign. And then the 22nd thousand will be the new beginning of the new heaven and the new earth and eternity. It's the story of 22, 7771, the menorah, right? The, the branches, it has uh, from the left and on the right side. And then one in the middle. It has 777 and then one. It's the story of the end of days. What is this first creation? Spirit. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without, uh, was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We've taught it many times. This word beginning is the word Jesus. It's the word for the feast of first fruits. Jesus is the beginning first fruits. He is the first. He is the beginning. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega, right? One and 22. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first fruits of the feast of first fruits. This is the beginning when Jesus was the beginning who, who created everything by God who gave it to him. So it says in the beginning, which means in Jesus, God the Father created. You see, did, did God create it all or did Jesus create it all? Jesus created it all. But the Father owned it all. So even though Jesus created it, it was the Father that gave it to him to say, go and create. And everything was created by Jesus by the, from the Father who gave it to him to go do it. And what is this entire portion? Spirit. So you've got the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. This is very key for us, right? So what do we know? If the first group is Spirit, and the first group going are those who are in Christ spirit filled. Hello. We know that the second group, which will remain in all those who go to paradise, were part of what? The light group. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, it wasn't the sun. It wasn't the moon. They weren't created yet. That's because this light, as we've taught, we know is Christ Jesus. He was the beginning. And it was spirit. Then God made him light. And the creation and the light beings were then created and everything around that. So if the first portion is spirit, wouldn't it make sense that the first group must be spirit filled to go? Wouldn't it make sense that they would be the group chosen before the foundation of the earth? Because they were part of that first creation. Those who were spirit filled. You see how that works? <clears throat> it's incredible to see. Incredible, incredible to read. All those going pre-trib to the third heaven. They were before the foundation of the world. And specifically, the remnant group were chosen before the foundation of the world to serve him spirit-filled in Christ and remain as that remnant group who are the usefulness of the bride. Watch this. What about 2 Peter? 
<clears throat> when we come to Second Peter, we read this about what it says here in Second Peter. We'll start in uh, where are we? Second Peter one, yeah. Second Peter chapter one, starting in verse nine. But he that lacketh th uh, these things is blind and cannot see far off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whoa. Whoa. You're, gonna, you're noticing a theme. It's If you plan on being a remnant worker and you believe you're a remnant worker, well, then you're also part of the pre-trib group. That's just you believe you're being chosen out of it. Well, if everybody that's pre-trib is connected to a water baptism in the receiving of the Holy Ghost, you think maybe you should be water baptized? Remember who this group is from 1 Peter chapter 1? Right? So we see that conversation in 2 Peter. Well, 1 Peter is where, of course, the story starts. And look at who he begins with. 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers. Strangers are spoken of as Gentiles. What does it say? The elect. The elect, the favorite chosen. According to the foreknowledge of God, <coughs> the Father, through the what? <laughs> Wait, let's see that again. Through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be unto you. What, who is this group? Remember, this is all connected to even Second Peter 2 and what we've been talking about in Romans. In verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away reserved for you reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time which means the end of days this is that same group right we've we covered all of this recently spirit filled sanctified through the spirit the elect through the foreknowledge of christ and they are strangers because just as Romans told us earlier, not only, he said, right? Not only to us, but also of the Gentiles, the vessels that are about to be made known for known by the Father. Look at this in Acts chapter 10. For those that, that are still saying, well, maybe it's not really needed. Well, let's, let, let's go to another one. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to go starting in verse 44. So it says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Oh, see, so the Holy Ghost can fall on them beforehand. Yeah, they sure, he sure can. We've even seen this. I've watched something... Uh, Recently, it's been going around on Joe Rogan in a little clip that spoke about, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. He's done actually some movies. He was pretty funny on uh, the movie A-Team um, when he played Mr. T, the old Mr. T. He was pretty good in it. Well, that that uh, old MMA fighter, I don't watch that, but the movie he did was good. And he spoke about this this demon possession and, and this uncomfortable feeling that he had had and his son and his son came to stay with him, and 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 he was demon possessed. And his then the father prayed over him, and, and he started spewing stuff up. And he gave himself his life to Christ. And what happened? A repentance happened. A repentance. So did it seem like he received the Holy Ghost in it? Like first, he sure did. And he started to change these things that he was doing. Didn't he didn't want to do anymore? Isn't that the story? That's the 180. That's the repentance. That's what the pastor was talking about. To, to go to one end and say, no, I'm turning and going the other way. That's the spirit at work in us. 
So listen to what it says. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Did he say you guys have the option to be baptized? Maybe since you guys received the Holy Ghost, you, you don't really need baptism? Nope. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Nope. In the name of the Lord. You get it? Baptism. In Jesus' name, that is in Christ, spirit-filled. It is our Second Corinthians chapter 12, above 14 years. I knew a man in Christ, in Christ, above 14 years. That's the 50 days. That's the pre-trip. And what does it say about them? Such and one. Meaning like a rapture. Like a caught up. Harpazzo. Do you guys remember? The 11th into the 12th of August. Sunset in Jerusalem is what? 7.26 p.m. On the date we've been talking about? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. 7.26 p.m. People say there is no word for rapture. Yeah, that the word caught up, 726G, harpazo, is the Greek word for rapture. Don't listen to people that don't study their scriptures. Don't listen if they don't understand Greek word uh, um, translations. If they don't have a strong concordance understanding, show them. Don't have to argue with them. Show them and let them understand it. Take the word harpazo, show them this. They say, oh, harpazo, how do you know that means rapture? Copy this, paste it, and say... Ask Google what it means in, in English, and it'll say rapture, okay? But then listen to this. So this first group is in Christ. The second group, it says, and I knew such a man. So remember, these, this is the prophetic revelation of what Paul is saying in the is to come. Look at what the next person, okay? Yes, it was Paul, but in the is to come through the end time revelation of it. Then he says, I knew such a man. Well, look at what this means, like. So not really the same as the first one that is in Christ, but kind of like, you know, sort of. And where was he going? He was caught up. This is the was rapture caught up of Revelation 12, 5. Okay? This is the pre-trib, bride of Christ, which is the Paul as before the travail, right? Born out of due time, the Luke group going, and the remnant from among them. This are the ones that are what? Not quite in Christ, like the first one. That's why they're going to paradise. Remember what happened to the one on the cross that we just covered? Why didn't he go to paradise? He wasn't spirit-filled. There's a billion and a half people out there believing in Christ, not spirit-filled. And there's only about 10% of them that are actually spirit-filled. They've allowed the churches to deceive them in thinking all of these things, that baptism isn't necessary. Or that you're in such a, 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 a twisted thing of, of, of a Baptist church that you decide, look, you know that I love you and I believe you in, in, to your pastor, and you say, but I really want to get baptized in Jesus' name. And they tell you no. How's that going to make you feel? Why would you tell me no when it's in the word? 
they'll probably say, yeah, yeah, we know it's in the Word. This is the one we do. What do you do with that? You go elsewhere. Doesn't mean you need to leave your church, but go get baptized somewhere else. Don't be part of those kind of like the first ones. This is the group in Christ. Who is this group in Christ? We've gone to it many times. I'm going to do it again. I love this piece of scripture. Man, you want to talk about an awesome book? <laughs> it's Romans, man. I know many people love Romans, and there's probably good reason why everybody loves Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are sort of kind of like in Christ. No. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but by the Spirit. Who is this group? We just covered them. They're the first group above 14 years that are going to the third heaven. All of this continues to talk about this being in Christ, walking by the Spirit. In Christ, walking not after the flesh, but by the Spirit. In Christ, by the Spirit, not the flesh. And who are these guys? Let's read from verse 10. Actually, let's start in verse 9. But you are not of the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's none of the Spirit's. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, you see why? You see this dying to Christ by, by the water baptism so that you come up a new man in the Spirit, receiving the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit? That's what you're reading here in 8.11. But if the Spirit of him that raised Jesus up from the dead dwells in you, that raised up Christ from the dead, uh, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Remember I said they are the Genesis 1, 1 and 2 group because of the spirit of God? This is where you find that connection. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? those led by the Spirit of God. For you, are, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are in the creation of that Spirit. He knew us before the foundation of the earth, chosen from before the foundation of the earth. And then he goes on to talk about a remnant group within that group that remains. The Spirit itself bears witness with, witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, comma, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with them. You see? If we suffer as he suffered for us, you see, if we put our necks on the line, those that are part of the spirit in Christ, spirit filled, who are chosen from among, who will suffer with him so that they can be glorified together with them when they are resurrected to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. You see, it's all about being in Christ, spirit filled. If you're not in Christ, your portion is paradise. Those who believe, but are caught up in some of the things of the world, their portion is paradise. You see what's happening? And then what's, what's the purpose of this point, of this time for them in tribulation? What's the point of it? Why does so much destruction have to come then on people who still believe in Christ? Because they're gonna, he wants to know that they really believe in him. 
they're not going to have the rest of their lives. You understand that? When the seals start and they're still here, it's because their portion wasn't in the spirit. Their portion is the light. Their portion is when Christ became light in verse 3 of Genesis 1. Jesus came to what? Shed his light on the world. He said in Matthew 15, I came not but for the house of Israel. Well, the house of Israel is the world with the Gentiles grafted into them. The house of Judah is the house of Judah. Why else did God say to, to uh, uh, Abraham that your seed would be as numerous as the sand of the sea? If Jerusalem has only got 14, 15 million people on the earth. It's because the house of Israel is scattered. Those 10 tribes, they're scattered all throughout the earth and they're mixed in with the Gentiles, which is why they got grafted in, which is why Jesus came and said he has come for a light to shine his light on the earth to save the house of Israel. That's what he came for. He came for the house of Israel to shine his light, which is the second portion. Those who are Christ's. Those who are not really in Christ fully spirit-filled, but they believed on him and will willingly die in the typology of the one on the cross on the right hand of Jesus who believed in him and repented in that moment. Remember what it said again? Remember when we go into the prophetic of it? Now you can understand that still being in the is, we must be baptized in Jesus' name. But in the is to come, as soon as the pre-trib happens, there is nobody else going to the third heaven pre-trib. It's over. It's past. Which is why when we come in to what he tells them to do in Luke, in the, end, in the end of days is to come, there's no more conversation here about needing a baptism. Because it won't be necessary. Because all those coming in during seals are the portion of light that don't need a baptism anymore. Because theirs is paradise. You see how that works? That's why when we come to the end of Mark, Mark represents, so we go to the end of seals with that Luke 24, going in, following the Lord for 40 days, being anointed by the Holy Ghost and going out to work, to shed the light and to share the Lord during the time of seals, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of the greatest multitude rapture. I mean, in the midst of the chaos to bring in the greatest revival in human history, in the midst of the chaos of seals. As the Elijah company, who are going to bring back father and son, mother and daughter by the end of seals, by the end of the sixth year of seals. So when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, they will be reunited and ready to receive the Lord. Ready to be part of the great multitude rapture. So when we went earlier into Mark chapter 9, we saw that it said, till they have seen Right? So they will have seen him come at the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of the sixth year of seals. They will have seen the kingdom of God come with power. That's because right at the end of the sixth year of seals, they're going to see him coming on heavenly Mount Zion, destroying the enemies. You see? And then the seventh year of seals will begin on the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets. When that happens, we go into Revelation chapter 7. And Revelation chapter 7 begins with what? The 144,000 being sealed. We come into Mark 16, which is a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. And he's now choosing this typology of that second group, remember? Going now in reverse. The Luke group, the John group, now he's at the Mark group, end of seals. He's choosing the 144,000, and look what he's telling them. He that believeth, so they're still preaching, right? It's still tribulation. It's not the end of it yet. So they're still preaching. And he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So it sounds like you need to be believing and baptized. But then what does he say? But he that believeth not shall be damned. Which means as long as you believe, you won't be damned. Even if you're not baptized, you won't be damned because you believe. Hello. 
Do you see there's a whole group of people in the church? You've probably heard it throughout the years. I've heard it many times doing these teachings and talking on some of these points over the years that will say, you don't need to do anything except believe on Jesus' name. All you have to do is call out on the name of Jesus and you're saved. Well, is that not true? Well, if you believe it in your heart, remember, we, we just read earlier, unless you believed in vain. Okay? We're not talking about here if they believed in vain. But somebody who called on the name of the Lord and believed on in Christ Jesus, they will be saved. But if they were doing that right now, they believed on Christ Jesus and they were saved. It was not really a full repentance, but, you know, they, they preached it and they believed it and they weren't told about the other things and they believed on Christ Jesus. They were baptized. They, they didn't have the, the remission of sins portion or, or the, uh, uh, the repentance. Do you think the guy would be going or whoever it is would be going pre-trip? No. No, they won't be going pre-trip. They would be going to paradise. So even if they died in the chaos of the pre-trib, an earthquake opened and the person having just cried out to Christ and days later falls in when the pre-trib is taken and there's a great earthquake, for example, where would that person go? Would, do you think he'd be in the, in the third heaven or would he be in paradise? He'd be in paradise. You following? Look at this. This ties in to directly what we've shared on before in Joel chapter 2. We've got a video. If you scroll back a bit uh, in the video section on YouTube, you'll see one that talks about Joel. I think Joel in order or one, two, three or something like that. But it says Joel in the title. We have the revelation of the end of days in Joel. Chapter 1 is connected to the time of pre Chapter 2 is connected to mid, and chapter 3 is connected to post. Here he is, coming on his holy mountain Zion. This is the end of the sixth year of seals when they see him coming. And look at what we see down here. You'll hear a lot of people claim this, and we show it here in Joel chapter 2 because of where it is and the timing it's telling us. Okay, When the Lord is coming, it's the, we know it's the end of the sixth year of seals. The floors shall be full of wheat because the great multitude rapture is the spring wheat harvest in the seventh year of seals at the end of the sixth to the start of the seventh year of seals. And it says, and I will restore unto you the years that the locust had eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt uh, wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know okay and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed okay listen to this let's go to the last verse verse 32 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be rescued shall be saved preserved for in mount zion and in jerusalem shall be deliverance you know why because at the end of the sixth year of seals he's coming on heavenly mount zion which is the mountain carved without hand which is the mountain that destroys the feet and the image in daniel chapter 12 that is a mountain a rock carved without hand that becomes a great mountain it is the lord coming on heavenly mount zion at the end of the sixth year of seals where are they going they're going to paradise they don't need the baptism they're going to paradise and the baptism during the time of seals would be even hard to come by anyways. And there's no need for it anyways because they're not going to the third heaven. They will be going to paradise. Hello. It's wild. When you understand these connections and contract these things, it is so incredibly clear 
in the revelation of it. Now watch this. As we bring this home, let's go into John chapter 3. For those that have been watching for a while here in the ministry, you knew this part was coming. See, about you must be born again, right? The story with Nicodemus. This comes in verse 3 and verse 5. Jesus answering, uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right. Okay, that, what's that all about, right? Nicodemus gets a little, you know, you know, cocky, if you will. Oh, can a man be born again from his mother? And then he says in verse 5, Jesus, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Cannot see, right? Remember this group? In Luke chapter 9, unless you are born again, so you proclaim Christ as your Lord and Savior, unless you're born again, believing in Christ, you will not even see the kingdom of God come. Remember what we said in Mark 9? We've got a great, it was a wild, wild revelation that we recently did in, um, uh, right here, before the transfiguration. It's been some awesome teachings lately, guys. But um, in before the transfiguration, we show that what the wording in Luke before the transfiguration represents. We show what the wording before the transfiguration in Mark represents, and we show why there's no wording before the transfiguration in Matthews and what that means. To begin the chapter, there is a reason why there's only one verse in Mark why there's a number of verses in Luke and why there's no verses in Matthew before the transfiguration story of each. It's wild to see the purposefulness in the leading of the Spirit as to how these books were laid out by those who divided them in their chapters and verses, absolutely proving Spirit-led. Now watch this. Remember, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what does this say? 9-1 represents the end of the sixth year of seals. When you see at the end of the sixth year, the Lord's coming, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. This is this right here. The great multitude rapture doesn't happen at this point. It doesn't happen for a few more months, which means what? Till they have seen. Listen to what it says. Mark 9, 1. And he said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Hello. They will have seen. Who, who's going to see it? Who's not going to taste of death who will have seen it come with power? The Mark group who are born again. Isn't that exactly what John said? You will not be able to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Which means what? Here's the kingdom of God coming, and those who are left alive at that point that won't taste of death will be the ones to see it because they are the ones born again. What are they going to see? It's Luke's dis I mean, it's Mark's discourse. It's him coming at the day and hour no one knows, right? He's coming just before. And when he comes, what does it say? It says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. So he's in plural clouds coming on heavenly Mount Zion. I think we've got that picture here from our sister. Oh, I should have it. Yes, that Tammy did, right? So he's coming in a cloud before the 50 days begins, before the end of 70 years. At the end of the sixth year of seals, here he is coming on heavenly Mount Zion in plural clouds, and Feast of Trumpets begins the seventh year. 
Then you follow again to the end of the 70th year for Jerusalem from when they captured the other portion, which is the end of 13 years of tribulation, the end of the sixth year of trumpets. And here he is coming as lightning from one end unto the other, feet down on the Mount of Olives, on the clouds, in a cloud, on uh, in the clouds, plural, and on the clouds. This is all related to what they're seeing, him coming in the clouds in heavenly, with heavenly Mount Zion. And John just told us exactly that. Except you be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, now you know who they are who will see the kingdom of God. Those who are born again. But were they born again of water and of spirit? Nope. Because those born of water and spirit entered into what? They were taken before anything began. They don't even see Christ coming. The pre-trib doesn't happen at Luke's discourse, him coming in a cloud. That's him coming for his 40 days. Luke 21, 36 is the pre-trib escape verse. Luke 21, 36 is the 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Those in Christ, which we know from Romans 8, are the spirit-filled in Christ that'll be the ones that can what? Go into the third heaven. Hello. Everything over in order, over and over, tracking. So now this leads us back to the end. Let's go to Matthew 28 as we bring this home. So you notice we went Matthew to Mark to Luke to see how it is that we're living in the is. And then as the is to come comes to an end, we want to be all in Christ, spirit-filled, water baptized in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And once that pre-trib comes, Everybody who is in Christ, spirit-filled, in repentance for the remission of sins, having been baptized, received the Holy Ghost. They are going pre-trib, and a portion of them, the Lord will forewarn that to be ready when he returns from the wedding and will instruct them to sell their goods because the Lord will take care of them in what is about to take place. Then what comes? Then we're now going back from Luke into Mark. So now we've seen why Luke in the prophetic is to come doesn't talk about baptism. Then we go into Mark. And when we get to Mark's, we saw that in Mark chapter 16, why it didn't really matter to an extent whether they were baptized or not. Because there is no going into the third heaven. They're going to paradise. Which is why John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that when I return, I will receive you unto myself that where I am there, you might be also. That is his paradise group. That is the light group saved in the great multitude rapture. Now we get to Matthew doing full circle, wrapping it back around. In the prophetic is to come when we see them. Here he is now saying all power is given unto him in heaven and in the earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So now you see that the Lord, he is now returned, which is this prophetic picture of this angel with his countenance in Matthew in the resurrection in Matthew 28, 3. The prophetic end of days, it is the Lord in his countenance was like lightning. And his raiment was white as snow. This is like Luke chapter 24. When the Lord is coming as what? In verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When is this coming of the Son of Man? Well, it's like they asked him. When will be your coming in the end of the world? 
Well, at his coming, he's here with them until the end of the world, just like 28 says. And he's going to be as lightning from one end unto the other because he's coming on the clouds. And what do you see? The lightning being described, uh, his countenance being described as lightning. It's prophetic picture of Christ for the end. And so what do you see? Suddenly, you now understand this is the group going out during the millennial reign represented all the way from where we started this in 1 Corinthians 15 that began in the time of Christ from his resurrection where he met with the 12 tribes, right? The head of the 12 tribes, then met with the Mark group, then met with the John group apostles, then met with the Luke group. In the end of days, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, but in the end of days, you have uh, Luke, pre-trib, the apostles, then Mark's group, then Matthew's group. So the first will be last. The last will be first. And so here you are, full circle, back to the 12, during the millennial reign, which they're going out, no longer needing to preach, but teaching the ways of the Lord and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So then why is there this baptism? What does this baptism even exist for? Your first clue, it's in the Gospel of Matthew only. It's only in Matthew. It tells us something when you understand the differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to. So let's have a look at this connection to who they're speaking to. In Revelation chapter 20, here I'll go into my E sword again. In Revelation chapter 20, listen to what it says. Actually, no, we'll go to Revelation 20, but we need to start in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Watch this. Want to know who it's talking to? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's start in verse 28. And when all things, okay, actually, let's go even a little bit further. It, this gets really exciting because you understand in 1 Corinthians 15 here, it's now talking about the end, okay? Listen to this. Let's start in verse 24. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, 23. And why am I starting in 23? See this word coming? It's the same word found in Matthew 24 only in the Gospels. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are his at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now listen to this. For he must reign. So if this is the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of trumpets, right? The end of the 13th year. And he's, he's coming feet down. He's destroying the enemies, doing all that, right? Put down all of his power and all of his authority. What does he do after that? It's the millennial reign. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be uh, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Is death destroyed during the millennial reign? No. Remember, they're all going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the end of tribulation. At the last trump, right? At the last trumpet. They're going to be changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye. It has nothing to do with pre-trib. It's all about post-trib. So what do we know? It says the last enemy to be, to be destroyed is death. Well, if we go to Isaiah 65, we know that when people are changed and what's going to happen during the millennial reign again is it's going to go back to as it was in the beginning. They're going to be living hundreds of years old again. That's what Isaiah 66 says. I mean, Isaiah 65 says. That when he renews the earth at the end of that final year, during the Jubilee and water goes out from the throne and the earth is renewed, people will live again as they did back in the garden. They will live for, or, or, or even in Noah's days, Enoch's days, all that. They're going to live for hundreds of years. 
That's what it tells us, that somebody who dies at 100 would be as if they were a kid. Which means there's still death. And it says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Which means he's reigning for the thousand years, and the last enemy, which is death, is the end of the millennial reign. For he, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected which did put all things under him, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now listen to this. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? What shall they who were baptized for the dead. Now, are you baptized for the dead? Nope. I ain't baptized for the dead. I'm baptized for myself in Christ Jesus to be spirit-filled, to draw closer to Christ, to be in Christ spirit-filled. I don't, I'm not doing it for other people who are dead. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all why are they then baptized for the dead? Meaning there's a group of people being baptized on the earth for another group of people who have died, who will be part of a resurrection at the end of the millennial reign after he has reigned and subdued and killed and, and, uh, and, and destroyed death. So there's a period of time where baptizing is going on that isn't for the people that are being baptized. Isn't that wild? There's a group of people being baptized not for themselves, but for groups of people that are dead? Well, the, ex the connection to what this conversation is about is all prophetic. It's all related to the end of his reign once... Death is destroyed, which comes at the end of the millennial reign. Which means there's something happening during the millennial reign for a group of dead people. What do you think that is? There's a bunch of people being baptized for others who are dead. Do you see? In chapter 28 of Matthew, he's telling them, to go and teach the ways of the Lord during the millennial reign because he's here. He has come as lightning from one end to the other. He's dealt with all the enemies and now he's reigning until the end of the world and death will be subdued under his feet at the end of the millennial reign. So what is he telling them to go out and do during the millennial reign? Teach of his ways and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now do you understand why there's a baptism during the millennial reign? There's a group of people that's going to be resurrected. Right? Who are these people? I believe they probably all relate to the Old Testament. I believe it'll be those from the Old Testament. Listen to this. If we go to Revelation chapter 20, look what happens at the end of the millennial reign. Okay, at the end of the millennial reign, okay, Satan was defeated, thousand years are over which is the reign of Christ, Satan is loosed. There's the final Gog and Magog fight. Um, go down, fire came down, it devoured them all. And it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Of course, because the beast and the false prophet were killed in the 14th year of tribulation, in that seventh year of trumpets. So, and... They shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So what happens at the end of the millennial reign? Now Satan has gone into the pit. He, uh, uh, Sorry, into the lake of fire. And he's now there with the beast and the false prophet. They're the only three in there. What happens at the end of the millennial reign? Well, let's read it. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Right? Remember, a new heaven and a new earth come down after this, right? The old heaven and the, the old earth are done. And I saw the dead, small 
and great stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, and what? And the dead. Remember that baptism is for the dead. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Remember, on such the second death has no effect to these guys that got to reign with Christ and took part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, you see? If we go to Matthew and we close out the story here, remember Matthew 24's discourse continues into Matthew 25. Matthew 25 is about the end of that final 14th year. The Lord comes feet down on the Mount of Olives, feet down as lightning from one end unto the other at the beginning of the 14th year. That final year will be as it was in the days of Noah. And then you have the wedding, the, the whole real wedding that will take place. So you've got the, the marriage, contractual marriage, which is the Jewish one at the end of the 13th year. And then he's going to prepare the earth, right? She goes away and he prepares the earth, <coughs> prepares a place for her. And when the 14th year is done, when that final year is over, here he comes. It's his Jewish wedding on this one. And look at what we see. When the door is shut, <clears throat> we come down and we see this final judgment. This final judgment is not the judgment at the end of tribulation. This is the end of the millennial reign. It says in Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the glory of his angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left then uh, then shall the king say unto them on his right come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for I was hungered and you gave me meat and you gave me drink. Okay, actually, this sounds like that final year, right? Like when the final year is over, not the end of the millennial reign. But if we go down further, then we see in verse 41, then shall he say unto them on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you didn't give me to eat, right? And they're, they're arguing with them. And these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. So you can see this is talking about the even the end of the millennial reign. One great way I like to show this is when we see in 2 Peter 3.8, when God tells us that, but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, comma, and, meaning separately in addition to, a thousand years is as a day. We know that in the creation story, from when Jesus was made light, in verse 3, you had the creation of days then starting. To the Lord God, those are one day. But if we were there in the flesh, they would have all been like a thousand years for each day. But from the flesh, in chapter 2 of Genesis, we're living in the thousands of years. 6,000 years and then the thousand-year millennial reign. But to the Lord God, they're what? They're still one day. But we're living them as thousands, but to him they're as a day. Which means the seven days of creation were seven days to the Lord. And the 7,000 years that we're in are still like seven days to the Lord, which makes it what? Seven days and seven days, 14 days to the Lord from Genesis chapter three, when day one starts. But to us, we're living in the seven thousands as years. And if we were there in the flesh of time, 
in the creation of days, each one of them would have been a thousand. So it would have been 7,000 years. So you'd have 7,000 and 7,000, 14,000 years. What is the end of days? It's not only one day every year. It's not a thousand years for each year. Each one is a year. So to the Lord, each of the thousands is as a day. To us, each day is as a thousand. In the end of days, each seven and seven are one year each. Hello, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. Seven days in the day creation, seven days to God in the thousands. Seven days, which would have been 7,000 to us, 7,000 years in which we're living in right now. In the end of days, it's seven years and seven years. Why do I bring that up? Because the Lord is here for a thousand years during the millennial reign. How long will that thousand years feel like to those that are in the kingdom of God? Hello, might it feel like a year? You see what I'm saying? Might it feel like a year? Might it actually feel like a day if you were always in the kingdom? Because you're with the Lord? Because what's the story of the end of days? It's the story of all creation. 22. Seven preparing, which is the gap theory of Genesis 1-2, which, which covers the 50 days but really related to 7,000 years or seven days to the Lord. Then you have the seven days of creation to, the, to uh, what would be like to man 7,000 years. And then you got the 7,000 years that we're living in, which to the Lord is like days. And when it's over, when the millennial reign is over, that's the 21st, 21,000 as it would be for us, or the 21st day to the Lord, in the end of days, it's one year. And then what? The new beginning. 22. The final jubilee. Well, at the end of the millennial reign, as 21, it would be what? The new creation, the new beginning. It's wild how it works, man. It is so incredible once you see it, guys. So what was interesting that I found in, this, in the wording here in Matthew 28 is is the uh, uh, sorry in Matthew 25 is you know we know what Matthew 24 into 25 is we know it's trumpet judgments to the very end of trumpets and then you've got a conversation here which is the dead being raised some on his right some on his left and the ones who are on the right will inherit the kingdom this is this is the millennial reign talk i mean the end of the millennial reign talk this is a group that would appear because of the baptisms during the millennial reign when the end of days are done they're the ones resurrected to know if they shall go on to live with the lord forever that's what we're seeing so it almost seems like like it just casually continues the story right on through it says it right here right okay oh, we're, we're in revelation 20 right here right here whoops <laughs> matthew 25 all right so it's it's really interesting to track but this conversation in matthew 28 in this only place in scripture where being baptized in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost only happens in matthew 28 is clearly speaking to a portion of time when the lord is here on the earth and all things are in his power in heaven and on earth, in the physical sense, when he is here until the end of the world, when the tribes will be going out to teach of his ways and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, so that when the end of the millennial reign comes, those that will be resurrected on his right will have that resurrection through this baptism. Hence, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, being this conversation that tells us 
Christ rules until death is destroyed, which tells us it's until the end of the millennial reign, at which point a group of people who were being baptized for the dead will now take their part in their resurrection. It relates, I believe, I believe this conversation is all in relation to the Old Testament people when they will have their resurrection and they will be the ones on the right and the ones on the left will be going to the lake of fire. Brothers and sisters, it is all about the baptism in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cry out in repentance. Repent. Ask him for forgiveness. Pray over it. Be baptized. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in the remission and dying to the old man. And you will be changed. If you haven't done this yet, or if you've done it one of the other ways or didn't think it was necessary, I urge you now, in the 18 days that are left, get baptized. Be in Christ, spirit-filled, and take part in the pre-trib bride of Christ or remnant portion to serve him as those who will have part in the third heaven. Brothers and sisters, I pray for you every night. I love you. I pray for your families. And I am looking forward to meeting each and every one of you, your loved ones. I can't wait. And if we're here to remain and serve the Lord as it would appear we're being prepared for, I can't wait till we save some of our left behind families and friends or when others save them and we come to meet them as they come to Christ and be prepared and are then prepared for paradise. What an awesome, exciting time, guys. The end of days is at hand and we will continue to watch and pray and diligently seek him until we are Enoched right on target. I love you all. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.